All right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to How Boaters Can Help Champion Orca Recovery presentation. I am Rain Attiman, one of your hosts this evening. I'm with Washington Environmental Council, and I'm joined today, this evening, by my friend and colleague, Nora Nickham from the Seattle Aquarium. And we are here because June is proclaimed as Orca Action Month. It was created to bring together researchers, advocates, and orca lovers everywhere to raise awareness of the threats facing these highly endangered species and to celebrate these magnificent creatures. And for the six, past 16 years, June has been proclaimed as Orca Action Month by Governor of Washington. And for the first time in 2016, Gov uh, British Columbia and Oregon have followed suit. This presentation today is one of many activities, events, and engagements happening throughout uh, the region uh, for the month of June to bring educational, celebratory, and actionable events across the Salish Sea to you. Next slide. And we will begin our presentation with a some few interesting facts about the southern resident killer whale population so you can get to know them better. First off, they're matriarchal with social units called pods and our only known group of animals in the world where both the female and male offspring remain with their mothers for life. And fathers are from a different pod, thus there is no direct parental care by them. However, males do help raise the offspring in their own pod. Individuals share food just like humans do at the dinner table. Each pod uses distinctive calls um, to communicate and certain calls are shared between all three pods. They can top speeds of 25 to 30 miles per hour. And if you're a boater out there, that's about 21 to 26 knots. And they all have names like Oreo, Mako, Telequan, Heishka. And they use echolocation to find um, and chase and catch their prey. And we'll learn more about that later. Next. You may remember Telequa. She is the orca mom who carried her deceased newborn calf for 17 days uh, for 1,500 miles or so back in 2018. And it generated worldwide attention and grief and sorrow. And in 2020, she gave birth to Phoenix. And the most recent additions to the fragile population occurred in February and May of this year. But the births are tempered with the loss of two other pregnancies in the J-Pod earlier this year. And from the science, we know that calves are still very vulnerable as there is a 50% mortality in the first year alone. So the population is in need of more calves, especially females. The population is expected to recover. So we're keeping our fingers and toes crossed for them. Great, so we wanted to share a couple of maps of sightings data. Um, first to show how they travel around um, to different places at different times of year, but also just to make the point that they could be anywhere at any time. And it's important to always be on the lookout if you're out on the water both to give them plenty of space and to enjoy seeing them. So there are sightings from British Columbia all the way down to California as they travel around in search of salmon that are returning to spawn in different rivers at different times of year. They are found in the Salish Sea most often from May to October, feeding on summer and fall Chinook runs, especially historically those salmon that have been going back to the Fraser River in Vancouver. So you see those large dots, meaning more sightings on the west side of San Juan Island in Harrow Strait, which some call a salmon highway because of all the salmon returning to the Fraser River. Unfortunately, there haven't been as many salmon going back to that river in recent years, but um, hopefully we can turn that around. And then looking at, this is spring and summer and then fall, uh, they tend to go more often down into the central and south Puget Sound, especially J-Pod, as they look for um, chum and coho from a no number of rivers and streams, and they're also out on the coast sometimes at this time of year. So, as I said, just, you know, keep a lookout all the time. They could be in any part of the Salish Sea or out on the coast. We need to be ready to uh, enjoy seeing them and also make sure we're uh, practicing safe boating practices around them. Hey, Nora, since we have 
um, given some information about the Southern residents, let's get to know our audience a little. Um, I'm curious to know if folks, uh, where, if they're a boater, if you've seen uh, orcas from a boat, uh, here is a poll. Uh, so please fill it out and we'll share this information with the rest of the group. All right, people are filling it out. We have three out of eight people participating. Oh, now we're up to 50%. All right, last call. I'm gonna give a five second countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. And end the poll and let's share the results. Great. Lots of people have seen orcas. Yay. Both from boats and from shore. And we're definitely hoping to share things in this presentation that are uh, for boaters, but not just for boaters. So it's great to know. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking that poll. We'll have another one at, toward the end of the presentation. And now we're going to dive into the three main threats that are facing this endangered southern resident killer population. And the first one is lack of food. Uh, southern residents are highly selective in their prey choice, opting for bigger, fattier Chinook over other types of fish. And this constitutes 80% of their diet. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Nora? Uh, they feed on the Chinook salmon year round. Uh, in the spring, they venture down to the mouth of the Columbia River. And in the summer, they venture back into the Salish Sea and feed off the Fraser River stocks. And then during the fall and winter, they eat coho and chum when the Chinook aren't uh, available and plentiful. Next slide. Today, fish are smaller and fewer due to decades of habitat destruction, especially in the watersheds where salmon spawn. Uh, so impacts include barriers like dams, um, removal of vegetation along the shorelines, shoreline armoring, uh, and polluted toxic runoff. Shishnook salmon populations are down 60% since the Pacific Salmon Commission began tracking salmon data in 1984, and current numbers are 10% of historic levels. And so this puts a huge strain on the southern residents to find enough food, since all five of the uh, species listed are endangered or threatened. And these are throughout the orcas range, making this a limiting factor for their survival and recovery. So you might ask, how do orcas find prey, especially when prey is so limited? Well, southern residents use echolocation to locate and catch their prey by using a series of clicks emitted from an organ in their head called the melon, just like mine. And the sound wave bounces off the object in the whale's path and returns as an echo in their lower jaw and then up into their brain. And the echo helps distinguish different species of salmon by detecting its size, shape, structure, speed, direction, and even the size and shape of the fish's swim bladder, which is pretty remarkable. And once a salmon is detected, they hone in on the prey by switching to faster click, buzzes, and pulse calls. And this starts the pursuit of the salmon down to the deep water and then back up to the surface uh, to catch the prey. Next slide. Now, the second big uh, factor in the population's uh, uh, endangered status is toxics. Toxic pollution is a second of these threats, and it comes from untreated stormwater pollution, industrial discharges, and legacy of sources from decades ago that are still persistent in the environment. The chemicals in our waters enter the mar marine food chain, starting with the smallest of creatures, the zooplankton. And these organisms are eaten by small fish, which are then eaten by larger and larger fish. And with every step up the food chain, the concentration of these chemicals is magnified. And we call that biomagnification. And this causes more harm and greater risk to the marine mammals. And eventually orcas, which are on the top of the predator in the ocean, end up consuming the highest levels of contaminants, which are stored in their fat reserves over the long term. And by carrying these heavy contaminant loads in their bodies, 
Orcas have an increased risk of nutritional stress because they metabolize these chemicals from their fat reserves when they're unable to obtain enough food. And this can cause immune system depression, reproductive impairment, and developmental problems in the whales. And as you can see, mammal eating transients have one additional food chain layer. Uh, so that amplifies a concentration of contaminant load even more. And transients have higher um, toxic loads. But they do not draw on the fat reserves because they have plenty to eat right now. Next slide. And then when female orcas give birth and nurse, they transfer the toxics stored in their bodies to their calves. And the amount of toxics a calf gets depends on whether it was a firstborn or if it has siblings. So basically the firstborn gets the bigger dose of uh, chemicals. Next. All right, this is me. So the third threat we're gonna talk about is underwater noise and disturbance from all different sources, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about vessels today, but it can also come from construction and Navy sonar testing and other things as well. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of boats in the Salish Sea that make noise. So it's just a noisy place. We've got a lot of population centers around here, a lot of traffic going around. It's a noisy place. If you live underwater, there's everything from many, many daily vessel or ferry transits to cargo ships and container ships, Navy vessels, uh, recreational boats. Uh, all kinds of different uh, boats. And the faster they go, the more noise they make, but it's not just about noise. It's also about uh, vessel presence, uh, disturbing orca behavior. So we're gonna just talk a little bit about the science here. So for example, studies show that when boats are around, even if they're not moving, orcas reduce the amount of time that they are foraging and uh, spend more time traveling. So the blue bar on the left, it shows um, more of their time spent foraging when there are not boats around. And the purple bar shows um, less of their time spent foraging when there are boats around. More recently, there was a study that came out in January, 2021 by Marla Holt um, and others uh, showing that um, they used tags that they put directly on the orcas temporarily with suction cups, which uh, lets you see more about what's happening with the orca's behavior underwater when you can't see them from the surface. And they found that whales made fewer dives involving prey capture and spent less time in those dives when vessels had an average distance less than 400 yards. And females in particular changed their behavior more. They either stopped foraging or did not initiate foraging dives. And there was concern also that noise at the surface could impede the orca's ability to share food, like Rain talked about before. They they catch a salmon, they bring it up to the surface and they share it, but that's more difficult if there is more noise and uh, more boats around. So we're particularly concerned about the impact on female orcas because for the population to recover, we need um, females to be able to uh, raise healthy calves and nurse them. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, we also, this is um, some information from Dr. Tim Reagan, who was the head of the Marine Mammal Commission for a while, and he has some numbers about reproductive capacity, and others are concerned about this as well. But as I mentioned, you, you need more reproductive females to be able to grow the population, and projections right now show a decline of about one-third in reproductive age females in the next 15 years or so. This is tempered a little bit recently by the good news that J59, one of the most recently born calves is a female. So we hope that she will thrive. There was also another study put out by NOAA scientists in August of last year. This is a graph where the green line are male Southern resident orcas and the purple line is female Southern resident orcas. And you can see on the left of the graph when vessel speed is zero knots, Females have about a 50% chance of catching the salmon that they're chasing, and male orcas have about a 75% chance of catching the salmon that they're chasing. As vessel, not, as vessel speed increases over to the right, going up to five to six knots, which is still not very fast, you can see that the chance of catching the salmon that they're after really goes down to less than 20% for females and less than 40% for males. Um, so this is just you know one of the reasons why we're trying to 
uh, share information about voting practices around orcas. You know, this might not be such a big problem if there were plenty of salmon, but unfortunately that's not the case. So in the near term, one of the things we can do is just improve their odds of catching the scarce salmon while we do as much as we can to restore salmon habitat and increase salmon abundance. The Governor's Orca Task Force uh, met from 2018 to 2019 and came up with about, I think it was 43 recommendations for recovering the orcas across all of the threats that we've discussed. These are just the ones related to um, vessels and noise, and quite a few of these are underway now through the Quiet Sound program, for example, which is up and running now and working to reduce noise from ships to the Washington State Ferries, getting funding to transition to hybrid vessels um, and other actions. So progress is being made, which is great. I think this is back to you, Rain. Oh, okay, well. Or maybe not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I can do it, no I'll do it. Um, so let's just talk about some things we can do, you know, whether we're boaters or not. And the first thing is the Be Whale Wise guidelines. Many of you may be aware of this already. If not, you can go to bewhalewise.org. These are things that are required by state and or federal laws, including a slow speed zone within half a nautical mile of the Southern resident orcas. Boats must slow to seven knots. And there are minimum distance regulations of 300 yards on either side of the orcas and 400 yards in front and behind. And these apply to all motorized and non-motorized vessels. Yeah, so uh, based on uh, the Be Whale Wise uh, and uh, vessel regulations, uh, several organizations, NGOs launched the Give Them Space campaign uh, in which uh, operators, kayak outfitters, recreational boaters, individuals would take a pledge to give the whales the space they need to forage, communicate, and successfully rear their new calves. And the idea is uh, for individuals to take a pledge and commit to staying the half nautical mile away from Southern residents and abide by the voluntary no-go zone off the west side of San Juan Islands during the summer months. And as of today, we have just under 200 pledge takers, including three commercial outfitters. And so we're encouraging you all as our audience to uh, take a moment uh, after this presentation and, and sign up and pledge to uh, give them space and encourage other boaters uh, to do so as well. Great. So another thing you can do to help, especially if you're a boater, is to look out for whale warning flags and consider getting one and having it available to fly yourself. So this is intended to be flown when whales are in the vicinity within one kilometer or 0.65 miles. And it's a way to alert other boaters to keep an eye out for whales, steer clear, um, keep them safe, give them space, and follow the Be Whale Wise guidelines. So if you see one of these flying, you know, take an extra close look out for whales, slow down, um, turn off your fish finders or depth, depth sounders if it's safe to do so and make sure you're following all the Be Whale Wise guidelines. Um, if you wanna get one of these flags, you can get them at Fisheries Supply. Yeah. And, yeah, and the next thing that you could do is download the Whale Report Alert System app and you can be a citizen scientist on the water or even on the shoreline. Um, and the idea here is you're helping um, mariners uh, stay away from uh, whales and uh, orcas and, and other mammals. And the idea here is when you report your sighting of a whale, dolphin, or porpoise, or sea turtle, uh, this, the information goes right to this app. And so large ships in the area will be immediately alerted to the presence of these animals. It's, this is like situational awareness that better enables vessels to undertake adaptive mitigation measures, such as slowing down, altering the course um, that they're taking. Crane, you just went mute, for me at least. Can you check, sound check? I'm not hearing you. I don't know if anyone else is having that trouble. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, there you are. Okay. okay, yep, you're back. So I don't know where you, I lost you all, but Situational awareness better enables vessels to um, undertake adaptive mitigation measures like slowing down or altering their course. 
Um, and the RASP is used throughout Washington State and British Columbia and by Washington State ferries, Puget Sound pilots, U.S. Navy, Port of Seattle, uh, Port of Vancouver, and recreational boaters because you're on the water, you're seeing things, you have the ability to report out. And so this is available uh, to download. So another tool for uh, helping with, um, with this uh, situational awareness. Next slide. Now you're on mute, Nora. Sorry, is this is the slideshow back? Because I think something happened to my Zoom for a second. Yes. Okay, great. So another thing we can do to help is protect eelgrass. And that can include if you're walking around on the shore, just being careful around it, walking around it if possible, but also if you're boating, avoiding anchoring in eelgrass. Eelgrass is really important habitat for crab, forage fish, baby salmon, um, and then having those salmon grow up to be uh, something that can support orcas. And it grows in shallow water from one to 30 feet deep, and it's in decline in a lot of places, including the San Juan Islands. So Friends of the San Juans has a great map and information about green boating and where to anchor safely out of eelgrass. So there's a um, QR code there and some information at sanwans.org slash green boating. And a few years ago, Washington State established the Puget Sound No Discharge Zone for all vessels. Uh, it's the first of its kind in the Pacific Northwest, and it's now illegal in certain areas in the Puget Sound and adjoining waters like Lake Washington and Lake uh, Union for boaters to discharge sewage, whether it's treated or untreated. And the No Discharge Zone is outlined in the Department of Ecology's inner, uh, Department of Ecology's website and shown on this map. And you can also download information, uh, an app for it. And it's really handy because as you're a boater and you're going from one um, marina to another, um, there are in, in, uh, information about where those uh, pump out stations are. Uh, it's a handy tool uh, for planning your trips. And like we said, this month is Orca Action Month. Every year we have a theme and we adopted Stream to Sea for this year. And our goal is to draw attention to the critical connection between salmon watersheds and river systems to the Salish Sea and the Pacific Ocean where orcas live, they travel, they communicate, they feed. And each week we will highlight and focus on one or two important river systems that are critical to salmon and orca recovery and provide ways our audience to be effective voices and advocate for them. So everyone is welcome and encouraged to participate. So you can go to orcamonth.com. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. That's the end of our presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I do see one question already from Martha, so we can tackle that one first. But if you have other questions, please add them to the chat in the meantime. So Martha's question was about the seal population growing exponentially. Is that an acknowledged reason for the reduction of salmon population for orca food consumption? And I will take a first crack at that, Rain, if you want to add anything. But yes, uh, seals do eat salmon. Seals also eat a lot of other kinds of fish, including fish that prey on baby salmon. So it's actually somewhat complicated. And um, you know, seals have rebounded because of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which is a good thing. Um, seals are also a really important prey source for the transient orcas. So that's one of the reasons the transients are not in trouble as much as the Southern residents because they have enough to eat, which is great. Um, so there is a lot of discussion. There was discussion at the Orca Task Force about seals and there's a Washington State Academy of Sciences study happening right now to learn more about that complicated ecosystem dynamic. Well stated, Nora, I do not have anything new to add to that, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity to do our uh, second poll uh, for, with our audience and I'll launch it now. And I would like to
to hear from folks of, of all this, of the several things that you learn about what you can do to help orcas, which activity or action will you commit to this summer? And um, it ranges from follow the be whale wise um, regs, take the give them space pledge, buy and use the whale warning flag, down land. Oh yeah, great. Down land and use the whale watch <laughs> alert system app. That <laughs> sounds like I'm in Australia. <laughs> Um, anchor out of eelgrass, pump out, don't dump out, and participate in Orca Month, which you're already do doing right now, so kudos. Yeah, if anyone has any other good action ideas, feel free to add them in the chats. We can all think about taking those additional actions. We need to do everything we can. For sure. And collectively, it all adds up. Yeah. All right. We have 66% participation rate. So I'll give uh, five, four, three, two, one, ending the poll. Dun, dun, dun. And their survey says, awesome. We have a really hey. good response rate here. It looks like folks are really engaged to commit to doing something this summer. Anywhere from and four activities to three activities to five. That's awesome. Right. And since the last thing on there was signing up for alerts with Seattle Aquarium and WC, I'll put that link in the chat. The Seattle Aquarium, you can pick from several different listservs, one of which is policy and advocacy. And so that's where we send out action alerts uh, uh, probably just about five or six times a year, trying to be strategic about times when we really need some additional voices to help get a bill across the finish line or something like that. Well, I, I got to admit, Nora, that WC sends a few more than just six or seven a year. That's that's important. Together, <laughs> we've got it covered. Yeah, we are an advocacy organization, so we really need to engage our yeah. members and the public. For sure. Yeah. Um, and do these educational uh, presentations. So I hope everybody had uh, an enjoyable evening. Thanks for spending 30 minutes of your time um, and hope to see you uh, on Orca Month activity or event somewhere down the line in the next couple of weeks. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye.